welcome to POTUS 2016, where we track the presidential horse race and pour cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. First, the headlines. A significant upset this week. Defying polls that had him down by 20 points and more, Senator Bernie Sanders defeated Secretary Hillary Clinton Tuesday in the diverse Rust Belt state of Michigan. Hillary did crush Bernie in Mississippi. And Donald Trump bounced back from his recent losses in Kansas and Maine, outpolling both John Kasich and Ted Cruz in Michigan. Ted Cruz took Ohio, uh, rather Idaho, convincingly, 17 points over Trump. Trump won Hawaii. And Marco Rubio, forgotten but not gone. He finished a dismal fourth, both in Michigan and Mississippi. What does all this tell us about the issues that matter to voters and the ultimate nominees? Let's begin with the context, the developments since we last got together. It was the week when the GOP's Never Trump movement got serious. Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud. His promises are as worthless as a degree from Trump University. Strong words from Mitt Romney, but apparently they did no damage or maybe help Trump. After winning on Tuesday, Donald proudly complained about having to put up with attacks from his rivals. $38 million worth of horrible lies, but that's okay. It shows you how brilliant the public is, because they knew they were lies. This past week also saw some hitting below the belt. Marco Rubio questioned Trump's manhood, prompting Trump to reassure the country that this wasn't a problem. These cries for attention did not enhance Rubio's image. As Trump put it after his wins on Tuesday, Hostility works for some people. It doesn't work for everybody. <laughs> Okay. Actually, Trump had to curb his own hostility this week and try to sound a bit more presidential. He had insisted that he would revive waterboarding, kill terrorist families, and that our soldiers would obey him whether the orders were legal or not. He retreated on Face the Nation with John Dickerson. We are playing by rules, but they have no rules. It's very hard to win Isn't when that's that the case. Is that what separates us from the savages? No, I don't think rules. so. No, we have to beat the savages and therefore throw all rules out. We have to beat the savages. By being savages. No, we, well, look, you have to play the game the way they're playing the game. You're not gonna win if we're soft and they're, they have no rules. Now, I wanna stay within the laws, I wanna do all of that, but I think we have to increase the laws because the laws are not working. This week, Trump also said, I'm changing, and now he favors visas for highly skilled foreigners who previously were, in his words, decimating American workers. One highly skilled worker left the presidential race this week, neurosurgeon Ben Carson. And former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg also dropped out, which isn't easy when you're not in, but the billionaire independent had in fact paid for polling in 22 states, opened headquarters in two states, and made campaign ads. In the end, his research made it clear that he'd be a spoiler making it easier for Trump, a man he calls a divisive demagogue, preying on people's prejudices. Two more bits of context. Leading up to her loss in Tuesday's primary in Michigan, Hillary stretched the truth, claiming Bernie voted against the auto bailout. In fact, he voted both ways, for one auto bailout bill that failed to pass, and then against one tied to the huge Wall Street bailout. Bernie also caused a stir this week, saying, when you are white, you don't know what it is like to be poor, which to some suggested that Bernie thinks all people who are poor are black or all black people are poor. No harm, quite the opposite. Bernie took 35% of the black vote in Michigan, damaging Hillary's firewall of black voters, though Bernie only got 10% of the black vote in Mississippi. To conclude the POTUS 2016 roundup, we note that this past week, Nancy Reagan died at age 94. One thing she did not like, today's politicians claiming to know where her devoted husband Ronald would have stood on every issue. He was a pragmatist, she said. This election year, Nan Nancy must have been quite annoyed quite a lot of the time. All right, now for a closer look at the numbers, determining the fate of these political nags. Yes, time for the horse race. For the most part, it was a two-man Republican race on Tuesday, as Donald Trump and Ted Cruz swept the table in four states. Trump, Trump took home top delegate prizes in Mississippi and Michigan and Hawaii. 
including a second place finish in Idaho, Trump added a total of 69 delegates to his tally. After Tuesday, Donald Trump had won all deep south states and appears to be holding his own in the Rust Belt. Talk of a Trump uh, hitting his peak, perhaps a bit premature at this moment. But the Donald did have to share the night with Ted Cruz, who took home 50 delegates and stays within 100 of Trump. In Michigan, Tuesday's tightest race, John Kasich also added 17 delegates to his pile and helped shut out Marco Rubio entirely from the night's spoils. Contributing to Rubio's poor showing on Tuesday were slender 5 and 9 percent takes in Mississippi and Michigan that failed to meet the mandatory 15 percent thresholds to earn any delegates at all. Again missing by a hair in Idaho, Rubio's 18 percent of the vote fell two points shy of the 20 percent required there. A very bad night for Rubio, who has won just two primaries so far in Minnesota and Puerto Rico. Adding insult to injury, Kasich was the winner among Tuesday's late deciding voters. On the Democratic side, Sanders showed he could chip away at Clinton's base, winning over white, blue-collar workers. Sanders now trails Clinton in the nomination race by 650 delegates, however, math that is becoming increasingly hard to beat as Hillary has crossed the halfway mark to the finish line. Looking towards March 15th, it will be win or go home for two candidates as 367 delegates go up for grabs. Four contests on the Republican side, including Marco Rubio's home state of Florida and John Kasich's home state of Ohio. They are winner take all. All right, time to discuss all this with Claire Malone, senior writer at 538.com, which is famous for predicting the future by crunching numbers really, really well. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Michigan. Michigan. Your polling uh, aggregates, uh, plus all the other models, seem to show Hillary Clinton winning on the Democratic side. She did not. What happened? Yeah. Uh, well, it was a, uh, a huge polling surprise. So what we do is is we, we aggregate the polls that are done on the ground and then sort of weight them based on on a, on a model that we do. And, and all of the polls were showing Clinton at this really wide margin of 20%. Um, and so, you know, the last time that a polling upset this big happened was, you know, 1984 with, with Gary Hart and Mondale. This was the biggest polling upset since 1984? <laughs> well, you know what? New Hampshire and Barack Obama... Uh, and Hillary Clinton. That was a polling upset. Um, but when I she think came back when she came case, back, yes, correct. Um, I think we're all a little bit uh, still trying to figure out what happened. You know, a lot of the polls that were done um, did not, you know, were done before the Democratic debate on Sunday night. So perhaps voters felt very strongly about how Bernie Sanders performed. He was definitely um, going hard on, on things like NAFTA, free trade agreements that a lot of Michiganders, you know, th those, those issues are really important to them. Um, there are other theories that maybe people uh, who would have been Clinton supporters said, hey, you know, she's got a pretty cushy lead. Maybe I'll take a, a, little, a little ideological vote out and say, you know, I like what Bernie Sanders has, is, you know, is saying out here. So we're, I think we're all, you know, he did better with black voters uh, in, in that state than we, we thought he would. Uh, so it's a little bit of a, it's a, it's a lot of factors, I think, that are coming together to, to give everyone a little bit of a shock. Let's talk about the black voters. He got 35 percent of black voters in Michigan, mm -hmm. just 10 percent in Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. Why the difference? I think a lot of it does have to do with the fact that um, regardless of race in the industrial Midwest, people's, uh, pe you know, the, the message that Bernie Sanders has about uh, corporate wealth and jobs going overseas. It resonates, you know. Uh, the big three auto manufacturers don't just, uh, don't and didn't just employ white working class voter, voters, that, you know, people. Uh, there are a lot of uh, black voters for whom that Bernie Sanders message, I think, does resonate. Um, and, you know, they might, uh, I think we talk a lot about how the Clinton um, infrastructure has long had, had ties with black Southern institutions and and um, you know maybe that just mattered less up in Michigan it's one of those sort of slippery things that, but I think his economic message his one issue candidate thing really did play well there it's funny about that Sunday night debate I think there might be a difference um, among people who just saw the news coverage after the debate and people who actually watched the debate yeah 
because in the debate, uh, Sanders was on the attack a lot. Sure. Like you were saying, he was pressing Clinton on trade and on her Wall Street ties. Right. Um, whereas the news coverage seemed to focus on two Sanders controversies. One was the thing that I mentioned about when he referred to blacks living in the ghetto and blacks being poor and whites don't understand that right. and he got some blowback for using the word ghetto and for suggesting kind right. of by accident that uh, black people are poor people and whites aren't. Um, and also the thing about the auto bailout right. where Hillary, as I mentioned, kind of twisted the truth in saying that Sanders voted against the auto bailout. Here, here's a little bit of Sanders after that debate clarifying what he meant. There was one vote to support the automotive industry. And I believe, of course I knew at the time, that if that industry went down, millions of jobs, not only in Michigan and Ohio, but all over this country would be impacted. Of course I voted in the one Senate vote that I had the opportunity to vote to support the automobile industry. What I did not vote for was the bailout of Wall Street. Because the TARP, the Wall Street bailout, money from which was later used for the auto industry bailout, did not originally include the auto industry bailout at the time he voted against it, against it and Clinton voted for it. But she, he was surprised by that attack, I think, and he didn't have the presence to say that on Sunday night, and then that's how it got covered by the press who didn't do their homework. <laughs> right. But I think in some ways that Bernie Sanders, you know, it's, it's only one debate, right? There, is, there, is, there are limits to the horse race, and, yes. and, and Bernie Sanders has built a brand that is... I think that people, you know, when you look at sort of the breakdown of exit polls, Sanders wins a lot on the, you know, Clinton will win on the experience points, but Sanders wins on trustworthiness and honesty, which we saw coming out of, out of the Michigan polls. So qualitatively, he's, he's got that strong brand. And also, you know, NAFTA and things like that, 90s trade agreements, the name Clinton doesn't ring often too well with people in the industrial Midwest. Including last weekend, Sanders won four out of six states because he also won Nebraska and Kansas and Maine over the weekend, four out of six states. But he actually lost ground in the delegate count, didn't yeah. he? Yes, he did. The math is still very, it's a great, it's a great win for the Sanders team, but the, the delegate count, the math um, is still very challenging for his team. Um, so I think, you, you know, he's, he's done well. He continues to do well with white working class voters. He won a state like Oklahoma, which we actually weren't necessarily expecting him to win. It was, it was much more expected than Michigan was. Um, but I still think, I think, the, I think the win for Sanders is good because if anything, um, it's now making us think, well, hey, in, in Ohio, places like Ohio, which shares a lot of DNA with Michigan, he's polling at about the same place that he was, anywhere between, I want to say, 9 and 20 points but maybe those polls aren't reflecting sentiments that are moving, you know. Ohio, Illinois, Missouri, all on Tuesday, all, on, yeah. all somewhat similar. Somewhat similar. A little bit, you know, they do have a, a little bit of different characters, but they, they do have that kind of, there's a, there's a certain, uh, there's like a certain gritty uh, Midwest feeling And considering to them and, and, that he won Kansas and Nebraska. Right. Uh, if they're not more similar to Michigan, they're more similar to them. So right. that's going to be very interesting to see. Yes. All right, on the Republican side, what the heck happened to Marco Rubio? Marco Rubio. Um, Marco Rubio is, was, was trying, I think, to be all things to all people within the Republican Party. And I think in the end that, that might have sort of um, done him in a little bit. Uh, you know, he's obviously been raking in a lot of establishment support. Uh, and But, you know, he just can't win a contest. He doesn't have a strong, people, I don't think voters are getting a strong sense of who he is outside of. He has a little bit of a Kennedy-esque sort of thing. He's got a personal story like Obama. I mean, people make this comparison a lot, but he's a, he's a young senator who's very ambitious. Um, but that is, you know, with, with someone like Cruz, who, has, who is working the uh, evangelical, constitutional, sort of edging in on the libertarian territory. That's a strong brand that plays well in the South. John Kasich, as we've seen recently, has sort of never moved from what we thought of as establishment Republican six years ago. I mean, if people forget a little bit, but, but Marco Rubio came in on the Tea Party wave of things, and he sort of morphed into a guy who can, you know, speak establishment, right? But I, but I think he does sort of find himself caught in this odd area where he didn't really have a strong 
core of voters. He never had a really big ground game. I mean, Cruz was sort of famous for his Iowa ground game and really getting out that activist vote. And I think sometimes that early traction and that early, you know, Rubio was going to build, was always going to run a national campaign and people kept on saying that. But there is, I think, perhaps hindsight is twenty twenty, but you can say perhaps something, you know, ephemeral was lost. So there's no way for Marco Rubio to win the nomination through accumulating delegates in the primaries. The only reason for him to stay in, even through his home state, Florida's vote on this coming Tuesday, is to help the party deny Trump's ability to do that, right? Because right? if he takes all those, I think, 99 delegates, that's a lot, and Kasich wins Ohio, then that kind of blocks Trump's path to bringing a majority into the convention this summer and then anything is possible if the party really wants to stop Trump. Right. That's the only reason to, for Rubio to stay in fight, right? Right. I mean, Rubio is, is currently losing to Trump by quite a good margin. In the polls. In the polls in Florida. Uh, and, you know, Ted Cruz is breathing down his neck. And so I think you, we saw today that Carly Fiorina, who I think had been sort of maybe holding back and waiting to see who would, you know, who was going to do some winning, uh, has thrown her weight behind Ted Cruz. So I think a lot, you know, Florida's a winner-take-all state. If, if Rubio can't win Florida, what's he doing? All right. Since uh, jobs going overseas is such a big issue on both sides, yeah. stay right there. We're going to bring in some additional evidence. Time for evidence-based politics, where we meet a scholar who studied an issue oversimplified by campaign rhetoric. Donald Trump did well in Michigan this week, in part by attacking trade deals, like NAFTA, for sending jobs abroad. But do high corporate taxes export jobs as well? It shouldn't come as a surprise that businessman Trump wants to lower taxes on business. In his Super Tuesday victory speech last week, Trump did tie corporate taxes to businesses moving overseas. His proposal? We're lowering taxes on business. You look at all the companies that are moving out. When you see Pfizer moving to Ireland and you see so many other companies constantly, now they're leaving. They used to move from New York to Florida or they'd move from New Jersey to someplace else, Chris. But now they're moving from here. <laughs> But not that many people are leaving New Jersey. But Chris understands the problem, fully understands. Now they're leaving from places that they used to move to into other parts of the world. We can't let that happen. And you thought that was a Christie statue standing behind Trump. It moves. It's true that Pfizer Pharmaceuticals merged with an Irish company last year, a move largely seen as a tax dodge. What's the cost in jobs and to the Treasury when such moves happen? Joining us... Kimberly Clausing. She's a professor of economics at Reed College. Her paper is entitled The Effect of Profit Shifting on the Corporate Tax Base in the United States and Beyond. She joins us on Skype from the campus in Portland, Oregon. Professor Clausing, hello. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Can you explain this concept first of profit shifting? Yes, profit shifting occurs when a firm separates where profits are booked from where the real economic activity is occurring. So effectively, they book the income in a tax haven like Bermuda, but the income is really generated in a higher tax country like the United States or, or Germany. How bad is the problem right now, and is it getting worse over time? Yes, I estimate that the problem is pretty big right now. Uh, in the United States, I estimate that it costs the U.S. government over $100 billion each year. And there are similarly high costs in other high-tax countries. So if you look at the global cost, it's more like $300 billion a year. And this is a big cost because these are revenues the government is not receiving in, in the corporate tax. They either have to raise taxes in other areas, cut spending. Also a problem for the integrity of the tax system because you basically have a big group of taxpayers who's avoiding paying their tax due. Did the government change policy in some way in recent years to make this get worse, or is it more just pressure from the larger globalized economy? I would say there's a little bit of each at stake here. The government has done 
some regulatory changes that have facilitated this profit shifting. And the most obvious example is the check the box regulation where multinational firms can basically have entities disregarded completely for tax purposes. And uh, this creates uh, a much easier environment for them to shift income abroad. So that's part of it. Um, but another big issue uh, that has been a big part of this is the tax competition environment abroad, where you've got havens like Bermuda and Ireland and Luxembourg uh, lowering their tax rates and sort of encouraging this sort of behavior. Would tax reductions on business like Trump and others are proposing make a big difference in your opinion? In my opinion, it would not make a big difference. And the reason why it wouldn't is if you look at where all the income is being shifted to, about 98% of that $100 billion that we're losing is going to countries with tax rates that are below 15%. And if you look at companies like Pfizer, which Trump referenced in uh, his speech earlier, you'll notice that Pfizer's tax rate before they did the corporate inversion was 7.5%. So companies like Pfizer really want to get their tax rate from 7.5% closer to zero. Uh, so lowering it from our rate to 15% isn't going to reduce that motivation. So what would make a difference? Well, I think there are tons of things that we could do that would help reduce the ease of this sort of profit shifting. For instance, we could repeal the check the box regulation that I described. One can tighten rules on interest stripping where where firms basically take loans out from each other to move the profits abroad and there are lots of sort of other sort of basic base protections that we could do like a minimum tax on foreign income do jobs go with these companies when they stage these inversions or just their harder to tax profits for the owners profits are much more tax responsive than jobs are so if you look at the literature you see that firms are very adept at moving profits across borders. But if you look at where U.S. multinational firms locate jobs, the countries where the jobs are look very different from the countries where the profits are. So the countries where jobs are tend to be the usual suspect big market economies where you kind of want our global businesses to be serving those markets. You want U.S. firms to be able to go to Canada and Germany and Japan and serve their markets just like their firms come to our country and serve our markets. But it's, the profits are much more tax sensitive, and those are going to these much smaller and much lower tax rate countries in a, in a much greater uh, way. Trump seems to have two sets of positions on this. We played the clip where he wants to make it easier for companies by lowering the tax rate. But there are other times, and people may recognize this, when Trump wants to punish them. He blames Nabisco for moving some production from the U.S. to Mexico. He says he's not eating Oreos anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, he's boycotting Oreos. Ford to cars, too. S say Ford, he, Ford plants in, in Mexico, yeah. too. That's, That's right. Thing. So he yes, won't yes. drive Ford. Right. So <laughs> is this, do you see this, Professor, as a contradiction? Uh, on the one hand, saying we need to make it easier for them to keep their money in the country, and on the other hand, saying, you bad companies for moving jobs overseas, I'm going to boycott you? Or do they fit together somehow? Uh, yes, I don't think this is the only contradiction we've seen out of the Trump campaign, but I do believe there's some contradictions here. I think it's important to distinguish the sort of uh, economically efficient and rational types of location across borders that we see companies moving out, but we also see companies moving into the United States. So we're the largest recipient of foreign investment in addition to being the largest sender of outward investment. And that kind of activity can be very healthy and good for the global economy. But there's a second issue, which is uh, the this profit shifting issue, which is really much more about tax avoidance and just uh, doing something different from an accounting perspective that doesn't reflect what you're doing from a business perspective. And I think that's a separate issue from just international commerce, yeah. which I would argue is, is a much less problematic thing. Although it does raise some distributional issues that we might think about uh, in campaign season, like do we want to sort of think about uh, the losers from this sort of global integration and how we might be able to provide a safety net for them, for instance. Well, you know, the, the, the idea that um, that the U.S. receives a lot of foreign investment, I mean, are there are there parts of the country where there are brick and mortar factories or businesses that that are that can that, that show this? Are there particular regions or, you know, I'm sort of interested if there are voters who are sort of benefiting from that that foreign direct investment. 
I think the entire country benefits from foreign direct investment. And it's, and it's in a lot of places where people don't even fully realize that a company that they might have even thought of as an American company is, might be a foreign company. Uh, but foreign auto manufacturers is just one example. They have plants in the Midwest. They have plants in the American South. There's a plant in Alabama, I believe, and one in South Carolina, but also uh, plants throughout the, the sort of traditional um, industrial regions of the United States. But it's not just, you know, uh, that industry, there's there are high tech firms investing in the United States. There are services firms investing in, in the United States. So, if you really look at the scale of it, it, it's it's quite large. Very briefly, how different are the Democrats from what we were just describing as the Trump or Republican position? They seem much more interested in protecting the tax base and much less interested in just sort of handing out tax cuts. So, uh, if you look at the Clinton campaign, for instance, she has provoked proposals uh, aimed at curtailing inversions, which would include things like an exit tax, um, where if, uh, firms have to pay what they owe the U.S. government before they expatriate, uh, but also includes other sort of interest uh, stripping rules and the like. And so this reflects sort of a balance at closing some of these loopholes while still focusing on other aspects that keep uh, the U.S. economy competitive, like our uh, highly educated labor force, the infrastructure of the economy as a whole, and, and all of these other considerations. Professor, thank you very much. So in our last 30 seconds, Claire, how seriously do you take Trump as a general election candidate? Why wouldn't the electoral map come out the same way it did in 2012? Only more Latinos would come out and vote because they're so horrified and the Democrats would win by more than Obama <laughs> beat Romney. Well, I think should he get the nomination, that, that Democrats should should treat him pretty seriously. I think one of the things that, that sort of, you know, caught Republicans back on their heels was, was that a lot of people weren't taking him seriously. And I do think, you know, there have been a lot of polls that say, or, and, and Trump is more than willing to cite them, that says, you know, I'll do, I'll do very well against Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders in the general election. I think it's very hard to know at this point because I think that a lot of women, a lot of minorities might be, might find some enthusiasm to go out to the polls. Um, but you also could say that, that Trump, you know, a lot of Republicans, I think we need to remember, right. do not find him appealing. So they might you stay home. We'll see what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor, thank you. Thank and you. And that is POTUS 2016 for today. We're here each week at this hour calling the presidential horse race and throwing cold, hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. Coming up, crucial GOP winner-take-all contest in Ohio, Illinois, and Florida. Brace yourselves. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.